Um, and for those who, we, who have not met, I'm Michael Goldberg. I'm the executive director of our uh, Beal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm also an associate professor at the Weatherhead School of Management. I see my colleague, Tracy, just popping on. Um, Tracy, I'm in my office, um, I guess a couple floors below you. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to welcome sort of back to campus for, uh, as we do things these days uh, via Zoom, uh, Mark Roman, who's um, a really distinguished alum, has been doing some amazing things in his career, writing and speaking about them as well. So when we um, connected, we were really pleased that Mark was able to make the time to participate in our alumni speaker series. Um, all of our uh, speaker series events are moderated by um, our case students. And we're thrilled that Sanjeev Korg, um, who is an undergraduate student who actually had a great summer internship this summer working in the world of angel investing with North Coast Ventures and has been an active member of our Northeast Ohio Student Venture Fund chapter here at the university. So Sanjeev and I have gotten to know each other. So Sanjeev, thank you for for agreeing to do this today. Um, for those that are watching on LinkedIn Live, welcome. Um, put your any questions that you might have for Mark just in uh, your the comment box and Doug and I will be sort of monitoring. And if you're on Zoom, um, you can let um, Sanjeev know just by putting a message in the Zoom chat. Um, and if you're willing to ask the question directly, even better, um, or Sanjeev can read the question for you. Um, so with that, uh, Mark, thank you again for taking the time. And Sanjeev, thanks for moderating and over it to you, Sanjeev. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, hi, everyone. You know, uh, my, Michael sort of introduced me uh, for myself, but just want to say uh, I'm a sophomore double majoring in finance and accounting. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark, uh, for joining us. Uh, Mark is the founding partner of DeNova Advisors. He's an independent author. He's had a very successful career in healthcare operations management as well. And Mark graduated from Case in 1980 with a Bachelor of Science in Operations Management with concentrations in Organic Chemistry, Operations Research, and Organizational Behavior and Operational Design. How are you doing today, Mark? Hey, Sanjeev. Hey, Michael. Hey, all. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, as, uh, as these guys have said, uh, I graduated in 1980, <laughs> it was 40 years ago in May, May 10th as a matter of fact, that I walked across the stage at Severance Hall to, to grab my sheepskin and, uh, you know, kept on moving forward. I, uh, I joined uh, Arthur Anderson, Anderson Consulting, and I stayed through uh, for 11 years. I left, uh, I actually left Accenture as, a, uh, as an associate partner and uh, let me tell you, you will always have people that try to rain on your parade. I had so many people tell me, oh, my God, Mark, what the heck are you doing? You know, you can't leave Accenture. You're a partner. It's, and, well, I had been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug. And I moved to Chicago uh, where I uh, had a business partner. And uh, we started two small companies, one called Health Connections and another one called Health Network Ventures. And I probably always had more guts than brains <laughs> uh, because uh, um, we, uh, the, the woman who was my business partner, her, um, her husband was the, uh, the president of the American Medical, I'm sorry, the American Hospital Association. And he got us a, um, we, we figured out that what we were going to try to do was connectivity between companies and laboratories so that we could exchange information. And this was all kind of pre-internet. Uh, after we launched, uh, a new technology came out called Mosaic from Netscape, which was uh, one of the first browsers. So we went from green screen uh, to, uh, to Mosaic. And uh, so, like I said, I probably have always had more guts than brains. We, uh, we figured the, the telephone companies would be really primed for this because it would add additional uh, traffic over their networks, right? So we got, a, uh, we got an appointment with Bob Barnett, who was the, uh, the chairman and chief executive officer of Ameritech Corporation, which owned Ohio Bell, Illinois, Illinois Bell, Wisconsin Bell, Michigan Bell, Indiana Bell. 
And uh, we got an audience with him and we went in to ask for $10 million and we had done our business case and we had our, you know, our business model together and we had a, a bunch of overhead slides on transparencies. <laughs> so we could put them on the, and, and talk to Bob about, about. so we, we said, well, we need 10 million. And uh, Bob said, tell you what, uh, meet me up in uh, Wisconsin tomorrow. We were in Chicago and, um, you know, we'll talk more tomorrow. So we, we met in this office, a Ameritech office up in Wisconsin. And the next morning, his chopper came in and landed on the front yard and his executive assistants climbed out of the plane or out of the chopper and came in and Bob was walking with a, literally a paper shopping bag. And uh, we were sitting in a conference room and he dumps this paper bag with all these other pieces of paper in it. And we're like, what's this? And he said, these are my 94 year old mother's stuff. How is your solution going to fix this? <laughs> so we said, um, well, Bob, you know, give us an hour. Why don't you go get a cup of coffee? I'm sure you've got some phone calls to make, et cetera. So uh, he went away and came back an hour later. Well, we got on the whiteboard with post-it notes and double face tape and we did transaction flows of his mother's, like her visit uh, to a doctor and how her laboratory information could be available and who would pay for it, that type of thing. And uh, he, he understood what we were doing and he said, okay, I'll give you your 5 million. <laughs> well, being, being young and stupid, I said, uh, oh, Bob, no, Bob, it was 10 million. And he said, no, I said, I'll give you five. You sell it to somebody, they'll give you the other five. And uh, so we, we got an appointment with Gail Warden, who was the CEO of Aurora Health Systems in Milwaukee. And uh, we had dinner with Gail and showed him what we were doing. And he called Al Sinisi, who was the CIO, and said, Al, you know, what do you think about what these guys want to do? And Al said, thumbs up. This would help solve some of our problems. So um, Gail said, I'm in for five. Well, Gail... Gullinson and I looked at each other and we were like, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, this, uh, this caught the bus. <laughs> our, we have our 10 million. Now we've, uh, and that's, that's one piece of advice that I have for everybody is once you do get funding, your job isn't done. Matter of fact, your job is just beginning as an entrepreneur uh, because you cannot slack off because you got money in the bank and you can write checks and you can, staff or, or whatever, uh, that's when the fun really starts. So that was my first foray into entrepreneurship. And um, so we started off with 10 million. Uh, four years later, we had both companies. Uh, we had an annual run rate of revenue of about 250 million. And um, so we stayed with, the, with both companies for another two years. And then uh, six years into that venture, we sold both companies for 750 million giving our two initial investors, Ameritech and Aurora Health Systems, a, a really nice, healthy return. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, I was being recruited by IBM to go uh, help start the, uh, the IBM Consulting Group. And um, so I, the, the other thought that I want to leave with you is, from my perspective, entrepreneurship is, is a state of mind because I, let me tell you, at IBM, I could be incredibly entrepreneurial. I got an audience with, uh, well, Lou Gerstner was the CEO at the time. And I uh, said, uh, you know, Lou, we had similar, uh, similar idea to what we did with Ameritech. We called it HDN, Health Data Network. We branded it. And the, the issue that I had at IBM was we were a marketing machine. Man, we could... You know, I could throw a, some napkins at somebody and they'd have slides and brochures and, and you name it. But when it came to the operations, that was one of those things where it was like, oh, my God, if we sell this, how are we going to what are we going to do? <laughs> um, but um, but we got um, we got 85 million from Lou to uh, to start the HDN business. And uh, about three years later, we were up to 600 million. And we had only projected about 300 million. And Gerstner said, Roman, hey, uh, were you sandbagging? Uh, said, what are you talking about, Lou? 
he said, uh, why did you underestimate the, the revenue so severely? <laughs> we were like, we didn't expect we would get what we got, right? Then, so it was, uh, was one of those things. But, uh, you know, so I, and then I was, uh, so at IBM was my biggest uh, P&L. I had about a $19.5 billion P&L. Uh, but uh, when you get 30,000 people working for you, the, the bigger the numbers, the, the more places you have to squirrel away, you know, little funds for uh, market development or solution development or whatever it happened to be. But the, my message to you is you can be an incredibly entrepreneurial in a, uh, in a large organization. So it, uh, it is a, definitely a state of mind as well as a, a set of uh, technologies and, and capabilities that, that you all are, are learning. And, uh, and I started, uh, well, I, I worked at, um, at EDS and another one of those where I had people going, oh my God, Mark, you can't leave IBM. EDS is like going to the Marines from, you know, that's just crazy. That's Ross Perot. That's stupid. That's, so I had lots of people that were trying to rain on my parade, all every transition I made, uh, but uh, it was one of those where, um, you know, every initiated transaction that I made as far as my career was concerned, I had a basis for it, whether it was personal or professional, and everybody makes changes for, for lots of reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then subsequently I started uh, while well, working with uh, Lumeris, which is a, uh, a startup that uh, was, uh, was founded by uh, John Doerr and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Long. Uh, so we did a lot of work with, uh, with Clarkins and with, um, uh, with Camden Partners, which is the investment arm of, um, of the Johns Hopkins University Health System. But my, my message you is, um, you know, be authentic, be yourself. And I think it was I think it was Oscar Wilde who said, "Be yourself because everyone else is taken," which I you know think is is pretty humorous. But uh, don't try to be something that you're not. As I said, entrepreneurship is a state of mind, and don't let someone who has given up on their dreams talk you out of yours. Um, because, uh, and I I think I might have said it before. Just remember, when somebody says it's impossible, that's just an opinion. And there are, there are plenty of opinions out there. So as uh, folks that are, are coming up through the ranks and uh, kind of uh, planning your, your careers, uh, you know, my, my business partner, Greg Johnson, and I started uh, DeNovo Advisors uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and we have carved out a really unique niche for ourselves. We do operational diligence for uh, private equity and venture capital and for family offices of the ultra wealthy who want to make a direct investment in a, in a founder or in a, uh, in a business. And, um, you know, Greg, uh, Greg's kept me off the road. He, uh, he had the tremendous connections in, uh, in Northeast Ohio because Greg was a very successful entrepreneur and had a, uh, had a, uh, a custom uh, development shop uh, that uh, he ended up selling about five years ago. And uh, he and I decided to hang our shingle. Uh, and uh, operations diligence is, uh, is what we focus on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those areas where a lot of times operations, uh, when, when people think entrepreneurship, you think finance, right? You, you don't necessarily think operations. And, and let me tell you, you got you to gotta understand how money works. Uh, so that's the, that's the finance and the investing uh, components of it. So we don't do any of the financial diligence for these firms. And we don't do any of the legal diligence because every firm that we work with already has a legal team. They've already got a lot of smart MBAs and folks that are going to, um, you know, know what their heuristics are and uh, are going to be able to do the, um, the financial diligence. Uh, but, I'll, you know, I'll just share with you a couple of anecdotes. We, um, Greg and I met with the CEO of a, of a healthcare AI company a while ago, and he was looking for $20 million, and we were trying to hook him up with one of our clients, and uh, I'll change the name to protect the innocent. I'll just call him Colin. Um, said to Colin, well, what's your, what's your board made up? What do you, what's your board look like? And he said, my board? 
And I said, yeah, what do you, you know, who's your advisory board? Who, who is advising you on your growth path? And he said, well, you know, I've got my uncle and I've got someone else. And so anyway, we, we coached him on that. And then I, I asked him about his, um, his financials. I said, uh, how many years of audited financial statements do you have? And he said, well, my wife does the books. She uses QuickBooks. And I said, you know, that's cool. I mean, but who's, who's your auditor? Who, who has audited those financial statements? And he's had no idea what we were talking about. And I said, um, Colin, just I, forgive me, but nobody's going to give you $20 million uh, on your boyish good looks and charm. Uh, you have to understand they are going to want to see you succeed. And that's the other message that I have for you is don't treat your investors or your funding source. Don't treat them as the enemy. I'm, I'm always amazed at how uh, some entrepreneurs and founders look at a PE or, or venture capitalist as, you know, man, they're getting, they're getting too invasive. Uh, why are they asking all these questions? Well, guess what guys, they want to see you succeed as much as, or, or more than you do. So uh, take their advice. And um, you know, we've, we've done some, some coaching and some, some counseling, but um, you know, when you, when you look at your operations, uh, I think there's, there's several things that we look for. First of all, your operations have to be predictable. They have to be sustainable. They have to be resilient. They have to be stable. And maybe number one is they have to be defined. Um, and I'll just give you one example. What's your, uh, what's your operational flow for taking a prospect to a customer? What do you do? How, what's, what do those steps look like in your operations? And uh, are your operations, are they predictable? And are they documented? Are they maintained? And, and this one you'll probably chuckle at. Are they teachable? Can you actually instruct somebody on them? And then are they taught? Are your, are your people actually trained in their operations and what their role is? And do you have well-defined operations? And uh, many times, a lot of the, the private equity and, and venture firms will, will uh, not necessarily focus on, uh, on operations. And, and one of the things that, that Greg and I tell people is we give them confidence that the investment that they're making is sustainable and we give them confidence that the odds of getting a return on that investment are, are pretty high. Um, so, um, you know, that's, uh, we have, uh, we have one anecdote of, a uh, we were, my previous company creative evolution. I was uh, doing, um, commercialization of intellectual property for colleges, universities, and for, uh, for healthcare organizations. And I was dealing with a, a physician out of uh, Washington, D.C., out of Georgetown University Medical Center. And uh, he had uh, what I would almost call a nutraceutical company, not a pharmaceutical company, but he was, you know, making um, sublingual vitamins and uh, sports drinks with vitamins and, and things of that nature. And uh, we were doing a little bit of operations diligence with him. And, uh, you know, we, we looked as, as we do with our, with our engagements today, we were also looking at the staff and do you have the right athlete in the right position for, for lack of a, of a, another metaphor. And do you have folks out there that can, you know, can back up and we look at, uh, we look at suppliers as well when we look at operations. Um, and this is just as important as if you're a web-based company or if you're a manufacturing company, who are your suppliers and um, are your suppliers stable? And do you have, uh, do you have backup suppliers? So if you're using AWS for your, uh, for your hosting, let's say, uh, well, what would happen if AWS went offline or, or their contractual arrangements changed and would you, you know, would you look at Azure? Would you look at um, IBM? Would you look at some of the other web hosting types of services? And, and you really want to give some thought to that before you have something that is um, 
you know, catastrophic. When, so back to the story of the, the physician from Washington, D.C., he called one point in time, and one of the things that we highlighted in our operations diligence was they had all of their raw materials and finished product in a warehouse which was contiguous with the manufacturing floor. Well, you know, I mean, it's not rocket science. Uh, you know, didn't your grandmother or mom tell you don't put all your eggs in one basket? Well, we said, you know, you really ought to look at some contract manufacturing uh, uh, space because everything you've got is tied up in this one manufacturing facility and in the one warehouse. And you really ought to look at spreading your finished product and your raw materials a little bit. So we got a, a call. Uh, and he said, well, next time I'm in uh, Cleveland, we're going we're gonna to have an I told you so dinner. He said, do you know where I'm at? I said, no, I have no idea. He's calling off of his cell phone. He said, I'm in Atlanta. I'm, I'm flying out to LA. Um, the factory had a fire last night. I was like, oh, crap. You know, just one of those heart in your mouth, just sinking feelings. And um, he said, you know, you, I, I'll get you that. I told you so dinner. There's no joy in that for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, he lost about $40 million worth of raw material and finished product. Uh, the, the fire was actually contained relatively quickly. It was the, the, the problem was the, the factory and the warehouse had a wet fire suppression system. So everything, all of these dry materials for his uh, sublingual vitamins and all of that was ruined by the water. And then by the smoke, so you know, forty million dollar loss. Um, you know, it's one of those where I think it was Albert Einstein said, "In the in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity." <laughs> so, uh, you Mark, know. this is great. I want to make sure that uh, we make San we put Sanjeev to work here and, and getting some questions in as well. <laughs> okay. Great thing. So, Sanjeev. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Mark, I really appreciate you talking about. Uh, some stories around our longer career. I, I want to transition to to your current role at DeNovo. Um, you know, what what does it look like when you conduct due diligence for for investors, and you know, what are some steps that people can take um, to improve their quality of, of, of diligence? Sure. Well, uh, first off is uh, is uh, and this this is probably going to sound obvious, Sanjeev, but take advice. Uh, you know, reach out to people who have been there. And when you're engaging with a private equity or venture capital firm, sit down with them, interview them for lack of a better term and understand what their process is and what decisions they're going to make along the, the way with their process. And that's when it comes to the financial and the legal. We look at the operations. So we look for things like organizational charts, uh, we look for uh, for contracts with suppliers. Uh, we look at um, your uh, your sales and and marketing, your your distribution channels. Uh, we we really look at all of the the operations, and um, you know, Greg and I do ninety nine percent of our work is remote. It's just as we're doing today. It's via Zoom typically, um, because all of the the clients that we've got. Uh, with very rare exception, are people that we've worked with previously. And uh, that's just a, you know, I'll just tell you that. That's another thing. Guard your, uh, guard your LinkedIn profile and your, and your network religiously. Uh, try, not to, uh, try not to burn any bridges if you can. And, uh, and spread the word. Tell people what you're doing. And uh, you will be, uh, you know, I think you'll be surprised to see where tidbits of advice pop out of the woodwork or from your network and from folks that, um, and, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things, Sanjeev, where you don't ask, you don't get, right? Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're about ready to launch into uh, seeking, um, seeking funding, and, you know, it's, uh, Greg and I are actually authoring a, another book um, that we're, uh, you know, our... Uh, our working title is uh, The Definitive Guide to Financing Your Business 
for founders and entrepreneurs or what they didn't tell you in B school uh, about financing your business or expansion. And uh, we're, we're really covering the waterfront, right? We're looking at everything from bootstrapping um, to venture, to private equity, to family office, to things like um, SBA, Small Business Administration Loans, or um, specialty associations, right? I mean, when I lived in San Francisco, I did a lot of work with a, a, a group called AWIB, A-W-I-B, Asian Women in Business. And uh, they only funded um, businesses that were headed by Asian women. And they had a list of, of countries that they felt were, uh, were uh, in their uh, sweet spot. But they had a list of investors that only invested in, uh, in Asian women's businesses. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's, you'd be surprised at how many um, sources of funding there are out there. Uh, so, you know, ask around and, and don't be shy um, when, when you're looking at uh, financing. Um, you know, again, just keep asking questions until you're sure you know how you're going to answer the questions when they're asked of you. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you I, know, you know, one, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs, you know, what, what do they need to know when they're preparing for, you know, an influx of capital and, you know, how have you mentored uh, these people uh, along your time with, with DeNova? Sure. Well, first off, never, ever, ever lie. Never lie. Don't try to represent yourself as something that you're not um, because, uh, it will be found out. So it, you know, it goes back to my, my other statement about being authentic and, and being yourself. If you, have, uh, if you have issues, then raise them because uh, your, your financing organization is, is going to find those issues at some point in time. And, and back to an earlier statement that I made, they want you to succeed as much as you do uh, because they want to see a return or they, they certainly want to see their, their money back with, with some sort of a return at some point in the future. Um, so, uh, uh, and, you know, so it's one of those things where I, I, I like to do, and, and we've, we've done role play, right? And I know everybody kind of, oh, you know, the eyes roll in the back of your head when you say role play. Uh, but uh, sit down with one of your fraternity brothers or one of your business partners or, you uh, whomever. And, you know, I call it play stump the stars, right? Um, get yourself, uh, you know, talk to, talk to Michael and Doug and, and your, uh, your professors there at Case. And uh, I'm sure that they can link you up with folks in the business or uh, they can give you a, um, a list of, uh, of typical questions that get asked. And, uh, do some role play, do some, do some dress rehearsal, you know, and I'm a, I'm a big reader, right? Uh, I read all the time and I try to try to broaden my, uh, and I'm, I'm a nonfiction reader. Um, but at some point in time, you know, you can, you can learn two ways. You can learn vicariously, which is through reading and learning from other people's mistakes and other people's successes, or you can learn experientially. And at some point in time, you know, you can read about, uh, about swimming all you, all you want, but at some point in time, you have to, you have to get in the pool and um, you have to, you know, get out there. And uh, so the, the point being uh, practice and, and read as much as you can about it, but at some point in time, you know, it's going to be showtime. So, uh, so prepare for showtime. Um, and, and another piece of advice, and, and Greg and I have been doing uh, interviews for the, for the next book, and it, we just interviewed um, the head of healthcare for KKR, uh, for, for Kravis, uh, Kravis Coburg Roberts. Um, and it was funny because I said to Chris, what's, you know, what's one piece of advice you would have for an, an entrepreneur or a founder before? And he said, uh, Mark, you would be surprised how many people can't explain their business to us. It's all, 
locked up here. And uh, if you can't explain your business to, uh, to your fraternity brothers or to Michael or Doug or whomever, right, and have them understand it, you're, uh, you're not going to get a VC or a private equity firm or, uh, you know, a family office um, to, uh, to give you money when you can't explain it yourself. Uh, so have a good value proposition. And, um, and, you know, I said before, understand how money works. Uh, <laughs> you know, it sounds pretty obvious, uh, but, um, you know, understand what, uh, what sort of covenants and what sort of measurements come along with that funding source. Um, because you would be surprised how many organizations, and I'm not talking about entrepreneurial organizations, any organizations get in trouble because they're not in compliance with the covenants that they've agreed to with financing. Uh, you know, in a previous, uh, previous life, I, um, we went through a revenue and receivables reconstruction for a hospital system because they had a, they had a failed, uh, they had a failed billing conversion and um, they were not able to reconstruct their revenue and receivables for the, the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. And uh, they had a couple hundred million dollars in bonds that were outstanding uh, that were municipal bonds. And uh, they had, uh, you know, they're so, so anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. Uh, no, that's all right. Uh, you know, I want to, I want to pass this off to, to Michael. Michael, you had a question. Uh, how would you yeah, yeah, thank you. yourself and Thanks. Uh, thank you for your comment. Appreciate it. Um, Mark, I was glad that you touched on um, networking. It's a theme that we touch on a lot in the classroom. A number of our speakers in our entrepreneurship um, alumni speaker series have touched on it. I'm just sort of curious. I mean, we've got a number of, of students that are on today and even, even for alums. You know, you're somebody that uh, I would imagine a lot of folks are reaching out to for networking. And if you sort of put yourself in the, in the um, shoes of a student, like what are some tips um, if, a, if a current case student is reaching out to you? Um, you know, what, what, how do you stand out? What are, what are things that when you get, whether a LinkedIn invite or someone reach out to you, how do students, um, you know, show that, that it's worth, you know, engaging with them and sort of helping them in that networking process? Well, uh, I would say first off is to, uh, to explain what sort of information you're seeking by networking and uh, be specific, right? I had an outreach from, uh, from a case student, uh, I guess it was last week. And, you know, you talk about LinkedIn, Michael. I have a, I have a little over 8,000 uh, connections on LinkedIn. And as of this morning, there were about 2,400 views of my posts for this webcast, right? And uh, so I had the re outreach from several uh, case students. And um, one was, was very specific, said he wanted to know about my time with, uh, with Lumeris uh, because he uh, had read some things about John Doerr. And, uh, you know, John was on our board. So I know John, he's a, he's a personal friend. And so it was very specific. And uh, for those types of requests, I may not link in with you on LinkedIn because I, I really, I'm not one of those, I think they call them lions, uh, LinkedIn open networkers. I won't just accept a, a LinkedIn, uh, you know, request from anybody. I, I want to at least talk to you uh, before I'll uh, before I'll open up my network and my network is open. So, you know, if you're linked in with me on LinkedIn, you can see all of my other LinkedIn connections. Uh, and I, I think that's just uh, fair, but I, you know, be specific with, with what it is that you want to ask. Um, and so, so that individual, I, I sent a message through LinkedIn and said, you know, I'd be happy to talk next week. Um, here's kind of a couple days that work and, um, you know, I'd be, be happy to talk to you. As a matter of fact, um, uh, <laughs> Jin Sun, uh, when we were in doing, uh, intros earlier, Jin Sun mentioned, um, neurotechnology, right? 
Well, uh, Jim Cavuto, who's also a case alum, is the, uh, the executive editor of Neurotech News. And, um, and he specializes in, um, in, uh, in deep brain stimulation, so implants for, uh, for people that have uh, brain maladies. And uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where if Gene Sun hadn't said something about that, I would have never made the connection. But I offered to him that we could talk and I could certainly make an introduction to Jim. And, uh, you know, I'm always happy to do that. But I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very straight. I'm very upfront with people on my LinkedIn connections. I won't just... You know, I mean, I've, I've got uh, Newt Gingrich and Bill Frist and a number of other politicians on, you know, that, are, that I've worked with. And, uh, you know, people will reach out to me and say, hey, Mark, can you introduce me to, uh, to Newt Gingrich? You know, for what? what? What is it that you want to talk to Newt about? And, uh, you know, I have to be, I have to guard that uh, because uh, it's, it's just one of those things where, you're, you're extending your reputation by introducing somebody else. Uh, and, um, you know, your, your network is, is absolutely priceless. I mean, uh, you know, Greg and I chuckle because between the, between the two of us, we have about 12,000 connections on, on LinkedIn. And we've actually been uh, approached by some recruiting firms uh, to stand down from DeNovo and to become um, executive search partners with another firm. And it's, you know, it's pretty clear. They just want our network. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we're, that's not what we're interested in. Uh, but, you know, networking is, uh, is kind of the holy grail, Michael, as far as, uh, you know, getting out there. And uh, you'd be amazed at the connections that uh, people will. And anybody I've spoken with, um, you know, and I, I haven't mentioned it. I, I guess I mentioned the next book that, that Greg and I are writing. But in, in 2018, I had emergency brain surgery. And one of, my, one of my dreams was to always write a book. So when I was, uh, when I was in rehab, I, uh, I started doing interviews. And, you know, what does an old consultant do? You, you come up with a hypothesis and then you, uh, you start data gathering to either prove or disprove that hypothesis or fill in the, the gaps in your hypothesis. And, and I sat down and wrote, you know, conquering the boundaries of friendship. Uh, and I've always enjoyed writing, but I didn't know I would be any good at it. But this was a dream of mine. And I cannot tell you how many people, social workers, et cetera, that would say, Mark, you know, don't set yourself up for failure. Uh, that's really going to be, a, you know, taxing on your brain, et cetera. Um, and uh, I, I reached out through LinkedIn and s gave a brief synopsis of what the book was about. And I, I've interviewed over 200 men for the book. And uh, my next book, uh, which is uh, called You're Cured, The Definitive Guide to uh, Healing for Caregivers and Patients, which I, I wrote because of my brain surgery and that the title is partly because my neurosurgeon, when he was done, he came over to the operating table. He put his arms around me and he gave me a big hug. And he said, you never have to see me again. You're cured. And I was like, what? <laughs> wow. You know, that's crazy. Uh, you know, you talk about a joyous moment. Well, I, I went on to interview 400 people again, using LinkedIn people that I've know that have, you know, had traumatic physical injuries or mental injuries or, or whatever it happens to be. And, uh, you know, LinkedIn, I mean, any social media. So it's LinkedIn more from a professional standpoint, but depending upon, you know, what your niche is, Facebook or uh, uh, Insta, you know, uh, are, are certainly good platforms for getting your, getting your story out there and for, uh, you know, for making connections. So, uh, but I, my advice to, to anybody would be to, to guard your professional network uh, with your life because it will serve you for forever, right? I mean, I, like I said, for,
Uh oh, frozen. I'm gonna lost him. Um. Well. Um. Okay. Um. Well, we'll give Mark another second for his internet. Okay, Mark, you're back. The Williamsburg. Uh, your Williamsburg Wi-Fi connection is. You're still. You're muted, Mark. Yeah. The. Uh... We're, uh, we live about two and a half miles from the, uh, the CIA farm here that was uh, made famous in John Grisham novels. Okay. Um, so we lose internet and we lose cell service pretty frequently gotcha. uh, due, to, uh, due to it being blocked. Okay. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily an ideal, uh, ideal uh, environment yeah. for you. <laughs> Mark, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to ask this question to you. Yeah, um, go ahead, Sanjeev. You know, obviously, given given the current climate, uh, with with the labor market, the, the pandemic, you know, a lot of, a lot of students have, have had their internships canceled. You know, there, there's a lot of you know hiring concerns that people have. You know, coming out of college, you know, people considering maybe staying an extra year in school, getting a master's. Uh, you know, how how would you handle these you know adversities that that recent graduates are facing, and, and what advice would you give them? Well, uh, my the, the the main piece of advice I would give Sanjeev is don't give up. Right. This is uh, the COVID is a, uh, is uh, I mean, we're going to COVID is going to be with us forever. Right. It's a, it's a coronavirus. And um, so don't, you know, don't give up on your dream. Uh, just, you know, stay the course and uh, you will have setbacks in your career, uh, whether it's market setbacks or competitive setbacks, but, that's what, you know, that's what being resilient is about is uh, falling down and, and getting back up. And I, I do empathize with, uh, with recent graduates or, or folks that had, uh, uh, you know, internships, particularly this year that were canceled uh, because uh, internships are, are a fantastic way of getting experience in the field that you're interested in. Uh, and, you know, I'll just tell one other little story when I was, uh, and I'm sure they've both retired, but uh, Dale Flowers and Ron Ballou were both professors of um, operations and operations management. And uh, we started a little group with Ron uh, to do consulting work. And uh, Ron, you know, we wanted to do operations consulting. So, so we, we went out. And uh, a, a group of us actually got a, a, an assignment with Higby's, uh, which, was a, which was a local department store. Um, and Ron Ballou was the individual who oversaw our work. And uh, so while we were in school, we were doing store labor scheduling uh, because Higby's wasn't automated. So they still had paper schedules, but we looked at a number of different parameters like uh, the value of a, of a product, you know, so small leather goods are, are one of those things that can walk away pretty easily. Uh, so you don't put small leather goods by a, by a door. Well, Higby's is the old, uh, the, the casino building downtown on public square. And, um, you know, we would look at foot traffic. So we had a number of us that observed foot traffic uh, going through the stores and, uh, Ron validated our observations and, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, we, we, we created an opportunity and, uh, we got paid for it. Uh, Higby's, uh, you know, Higby's wanted to give us, uh, uh, give us money for what we had done. And, uh, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to take it. Uh, but it gave me some great experience of what it was like to be a consultant to, you know, uh, it, it, so stay the course, Sanjeev, uh, and, uh, you know, keep, keep plugging away and, uh, you know, use the time that you've got, assuming you've got additional time uh, to further your knowledge uh, by, by reading picking up the phone, calling people, sending emails. And I will, I will guarantee you that if you just spent 20 minutes a day reading about your 
particular field of interest, in 10 years, you will be in the top 1% of those people who know about that field. And, um, you know, you don't have to have a, a degree to, to do that, or you don't have to necessarily have experience. Uh, but certainly, again, with my, you know, metaphor before of uh, you can read all you want, but at some point in time, you got to jump in the pool. You got to get that, uh, that real life experience. I would say stay the course, Sanjeev. Don't, uh, don't give up and, uh, you know, put your, put your time to, uh, to use that, uh, you know, that you can continue on your course. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, th thanks a lot for that, Mark. Um, you know, I, I want to call on on Carlin. Uh, if you could please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Hey, Mark. Uh, this is Carlin Jackson. I graduated from Case a couple of years ago, computer science and master of finance. But I'm listening to you talk, and was really intrigued hearing about your specific focus on operations diligence, and I. Uh, I know you said you have a book coming out, but I wanted to know, have you guys already published like a checklist or something that entrepreneurs or founders could look towards to really make sure they're kind of do crossing their T's, uh, dying their eyes? You know, the short answer, Carlin, is no, we have not. Um, but, um, you know, certainly I, I don't remember whether you were on or not. So, you know, I, I talked about what we look for. Yeah, uh, and I would I would be certainly happy to send you my my bullet. Might have lost him again. He might be, he might be frozen. Okay. All right, we'll give Mark another second to hopefully let the CIA stop uh, blocking his. Uh... Oh, here he is. Okay, hey Mark. How's it going, Mark? Sorry, guys. No um, problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Carlin. We're answering Carlin's questions about uh, the checklist. Yeah. yeah, back to your question. The, the short answer is no. Uh, we don't. We haven't published anything. Uh, but I, I went through a list uh, before of kind of categories of uh, that you can, I'll say, do a self check on your operations, and are your uh, are your operations uh, predictable? Are they sustainable? Are they resilient? Are they stable? Are they defined? And, and when I say, are they defined? I mean, what are your, your business? Uh, and the, the example I gave was prospect to customer. What's your process? What's your, your operational prospe uh, process for taking a, a prospect and, and getting them to, uh, you know, to a paying customer? And uh, so are they defined? Are they predictable? Are they documented? Are they maintained when something changes in your operations? And then are they teachable? And are they taught? Do you actually, uh, do you actually teach folks, um, you know, how to, uh, are they teachable? Are they taught? And are they tested? Uh, those, are the, those are the types of things that, that we look for in operational diligence. And then we, we look for, for folks that have deep subject matter expertise. Uh, we have about 300 contractors that work for us, work with us. Uh, so if I need someone, if Greg needs someone who's uh, very deep in uh, process manufacturing, well, you know, we have, uh, we have some former um, chemi engineering uh, folks that uh, worked in the, uh, uh, worked in the, you know, oil and gas industry uh, or worked for groups like Dow or Air Products and, and that type of thing. So we'll, we'll bring that expertise to the table. Um, so it, uh, you know, Carlin, I guess the other, the other uh, category, category I would give you is, um, you know, industry knowledge and industry uh, specialization because particularly in healthcare, uh, when it comes to things like pharmaceuticals, we have a uh, we have a chain of uh, chain of custody that must be maintained uh, because let's let's say you're on some um, some prescription. Well, we have to know all of the lot numbers that went into making the particular batch 
that got sent out to your local CVS or Walgreens or whatever it happens to be, because if there were a, um, if there were a recall, if it was found out, uh, and, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen the, uh, you know, the advertisements about ranitidine, the old Zantac or the, the, the branded Zantac being uh, uh, containing uh, high amounts of carcinogens. And, um, you know, some of that chain of custody, particularly in those, um, in those generics, wasn't maintained. So just to be on the safe side, the FDA and, and a lot of the retailers have just pulled those. So, but having that knowledge and, and having it when you're examining the operations is critical. Uh, so any, anything with as far as compliance is concerned or uh, being tied to, uh, to industry specificity are, uh, are also, uh, you know, areas that, that we look at with, um, when we're doing operational diligence. So like I said, we've, we've carved out, carved out a, a fairly unique niche uh, for ourselves, uh, but it hasn't, hasn't been a hard sell uh, because a, a lot of the private equity firms and, and venture firms, particularly, um, you know, they're they're good at the market. They're they're great at marketing. They're great at finance, but not necessarily at operations. Yeah. Um, so I, that's a. I just like to say thanks. Um, right now, I'm in the middle or kind of initial stages of an angel raise, and the diligence yep. here isn't quite as sophisticated, but you know, kind of being a love of operations myself I always figure it's never too soon to start having the mindset at least so that you know it's not later down the road and we're just now getting started and cleaning up our you know operational story so yep um and i'm uh, gonna probably uh, send you a short note via email kind of follow yeah. up but yeah please um uh, my email is mark m-a-r-k at de novo d-e-n-o-v-o dot l-l-c and our our website is de novo dot l-l-c so feel free to uh, to peruse our uh, our website or send me a note. And uh, Carlin, I'll just tell you one of the one of the big growth areas right now for uh, for private equity and for venture is the role of operating partner. Uh, operating partners are um, people that private equity and venture firms put into their target investment companies to. Uh, Number one, to provide some oversight, but also to provide expertise on uh, a particular area where the, the investment target may not have that sophistication. Mm. So uh, keep, that, keep that operations focus because it, it can serve you well uh, in, you know, in the years coming. And uh, Greg and I have both had numerous offers from, uh, from private equity and from venture firms to serve as operating partners. Um, but yeah. you know, I, I like, I like the gig we've got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Carlin, for your question. Mark, really want to thank you for your time. Uh, you know, we're sort of, sort of running to that two o'clock mark. Uh, I want to pass it back yep. to Michael Goldberg. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for moderating and Mark, this is a great discussion. I'm glad we were able to power through a few, um, and the, and the new world order, the fact that we don't lose internet all the time, and, and <laughs> use all the time. Um, we only had a few, a few, few short moments where we lost you. So, um, but it was great. Um, I think your, um, advice for our young people, you know, and, and someone like Carl Jackson is an awesome, um, former student of mine who's a graduate who's out kind of in the entrepreneurial world, building a company, raising capital. I think that there was, um, there was a lot of, of wisdom and value in a lot of things that you shared today. So thank you for taking the time to. Well, with. thanks. Thanks, Michael and Sanjeev and Carlin and uh, Jen Soon and, and everybody for, for joining. And uh, whether you're watching us here on Zoom or if you're on uh, LinkedIn Live or Facebook, uh, whatever, uh, thanks for joining us and, and take advantage of the, the Veal Institute and uh, all of the research that you have at CASE. Um, you know, you got Bob Sopko over at uh, the Think Box, and uh, uh, you know, don't uh, don't hesitate to to ping Michael or or Elizabeth Elizabeth Klein, who's with uh, Alumni Relations, uh, because uh, she can she can hook you up as well. Uh, sure. 
No, and Bob and Elizabeth are both on, so it's great to, it's great to have them both here. Um, let me do a little admin for, a, a, for some advertising for future events. So um, on Thursday, we're back with our alumni speaker series, Matt Sommer, um, who was a former um, technology architect at Tesla and GoPro, really interesting technologist, um, business person, will be chatting um, with us today about his work in electric vehicles, or sorry, on Thursday at one o'clock. Then we'll be back next week for um, three different events. Um, on Tuesday, a friend of mine, um, Forrest Basin, who is the former Surgeon General of the US Navy and he's the Chief Healthcare Strategy Officer at Cleveland State University, will be with our speaker series. We'll actually be co-sponsoring that event with Cleveland State. So we'll have a student from Cleveland State and from Case moderating that event. Um, on Wednesday, we're partnering our other friends at the School of Medicine um, and we'll be hearing from Karen Spilzeski, who's a venture capitalist with Riverbest Venture Partners, talking about the basics of venture capital. That'll be on Wednesday at 4 p.m. And then on Thursday, I've got the book right here, in case he's watching, um, Ian Hathaway, who is the co-author of The Startup Community Way, Evolving an Entrepreneurial Ecosystem that he wrote with Brad Feld. Um, Ian will be part of our Beyond Silicon Valley class. That'll be next Thursday at 10 o'clock, so we've got a busy week. Um, so again, on behalf of uh, Doug and the others at the Beal Institute, thank you, Mark and Sanjeev, for taking the time, and we look forward to seeing you all soon.